Listen to Science, der Wissenschaftspodcast der Volkswagen Stiftung. Dear Minister Heinen Klajadzic, dear Ambassador Hadas Handelsmann, dear Dr. Kohl, dear ladies and gentlemen, in a certain way, Germany and Israel are almost twins. They were established within a few months in 1948 and 1949, respectively. Both were products of the greatest catastrophe in modern history. The state of Israel emerged literally out of the ashes of Auschwitz. The two Germanies were the products of a recently divided European landscape. History tied the fates of these states together, but it also created an enormous emotional gap between Germans and Jews and between Germans and Israelis. Diplomatic relations were not on the horizon during the first decades of the two states' existence, or at least the beginning of these two decades, although it should be noted that Israel was actually ready to establish diplomatic ties with Austria as early as the mid-50s when Austria received full sovereignty, thus in a way buying into that country's official version of being Hitler's first victim. The situation with Germany, though, was different. It can perhaps be best told by the words, symbolically perhaps, stamped into every Israeli passport until the mid-1950s, which read, valid in all countries with the exception of Germany, Prat Germania in Hebrew. When the Israeli government signaled its readiness to talk about diplomatic relations in the early 60s, it first encountered opposition actually in Germany especially the West German Foreign Office, was afraid that the Arabs in turn would recognize East Germany, which in fact they then did. And according to the Hallstein Doctrine, this would have resulted in severing ties between Bonn and the major oil supplying nations. When, in 1965, Germany and Israel did in fact establish official ties, the opposition came now mainly from within Israel. Both the far right and the far left thought it was too early to establish official contacts with the successor state of Nazi Germany. And I'm sure many of us have seen the images of stones throwing protesters in front of the Knesset and of the rough welcome the first German ambassador received in Israel in the mid-1960s. As for the cultural closeness and gap between the two nations, let me tell you a story of the encounter between the German and the Israeli delegations at the reparations negotiations in Holland. Almost all of the Israeli delegates, and we're talking now about the 1950s, early 1950s, almost all of the Israeli delegates were native German speakers. Their official order, however, was to speak either in Hebrew through an interpreter or in English. Thus, an official interpreter was required to translate between two native German speakers. Yet when the German delegate Otto Küster remarked to the Israeli delegate Felix Schinhal, the co-head of the Israeli delegation, that somehow he recognized through his Hebrew a Swabian accent, Schinhal confirmed this revealing that he was originally from Stuttgart. Küster, having also grown up in Stuttgart, soon discovered that they had attended the same school, not the same class, but the same school, and the two began to ponder about their childhood. They even wrote a postcard together to a former teacher both adored. This chance encounter broke the ice of the negotiations and from that moment onward, the Israeli delegates felt free to speak in German in spite of their official orders. And often, let me add this, often it is these personal encounters and, story, and stories which really are ice, uh, groundbreaking. 
The unique circumstances of this temporary linguistic cultural rapprochement underlines only, however, the exceptional status of German-Israeli relations after the Holocaust. New laws to restrict the use of German were issued in Israel again in the 1950s, actually even the early 1960s. In 1961, for example, the year of the Eichmann trial. Even the eventual, establ eventual establishment of diplomatic relations between the two countries was initially mainly restricted to the economic level and as we heard also scientific cooperation. And even though um, Volkswagen may not be the directly connected with the Volkswagen Foundation, let me at this place mention that Volkswagen played a pioneering role in these early economic ties as the company found a local dealer in Israel who very early on was willing to sell cars to the police and government officials in Israel in the 1960s and thus slowly gained recognition among a public still opposed to German good, buying German goods. But resistance was of course still widespread and at least one radio announcer refused to read the commercial Volkswagen, ein Auto ohne Probleme. Volkswagen, a car without problems. Germany provided Israel with important goods as part of the reparation agreement. And early on, Shimon Peres and Franz Josef Strauss had worked on secret weapon deals between the two countries. It seems that weapons and trade goods were easier to be exchanged than cultural products. The sensitivity in this area was especially high. Until 1961, there existed an official boycott of German cultural events in Israel. And after that, one still needed to apply to Israeli authorities for special permits to organize any cultural events in, in, with German citizens in Israel and vice versa for Israelis citizens who would perform in Germany. When Martin Buber earned the Hansische Goethe Prize as early as 1951, the outrage over his acceptance was so immense that he did not dare to travel to Germany to receive the prize. He did so, however, two years later when he was awarded, awarded the even more prestigious Peace Prize of the German book trade in Frankfurt. He went to Frankfurt and delivered a moving speech in the Paulskirche. While he was celebrated in Germany, especially by the students then, even his closest friends in Israel could not understand that he would speak in Frankfurt in front of potential murderers of his family and many other Israeli families. Gershom Scholem, probably the most important um, Israeli um, philosopher and the founder of the study of Jewish mysticism, still rejected in the 1960s and offered to come to Heidelberg as a visiting professor. As he said, I would have to work with the closest colleague in my field who was an active Nazi. Earlier on, Scholem had reprimanded Hans Joachim Schöps, one of the few Jewish intellectuals who returned from exile from Sweden as early as 1946. How can you breathe in this air, he asked Schöps. And when Scholem's Swiss publisher that had published his books in German until the 19, early 60s, he was bought by the German Zurkamp Verlag, he wondered for a while if he should not look rather for another Swiss publisher to publish, publish his German books. He then did go with Zurkamp until today. But already in the mid-60s, there were also new encounters. Among the first steps of German cultural activities in Israel were a Dada exhibition in Haifa and a visit of the Mülheimer Singkreis to Israel in 1966. The breakthrough, perhaps, was the visit of the writer Günther Grass in 1967, in March of 1967, just before the Six-Day War. Originally, it was actually Heinrich Böll, who was supposed to be the first German writer to officially tour the Jewish state. No one then, of course, knew 
of grass membership in the Waffen SS, which would become a hot topic of contention four decades later. In 1967, Grass was simply the young, provocative German writer who dared to address questions related to German guilt and whose tin drum was celebrated all over the world. Grass' visit caused a deep divide in Israel over Germany and the use of German language in public. Protests were mounted by parts of the Israeli public and political opposition and the Israeli Writers Association refused to receive the distinguished author. On the other hand, the Israeli government broke its own laws, at least officially, when it co-sponsored some of Grass's public appearances in German language. Grass was the first German citizen officially invited to give a public speech in Israel in the German language, and the Israeli president, the prime minister, and the minister of education all met with the writer, who faced an eager audience when he gave his Rede von der Gewöhnung, his speech on habituation, once in Tel Aviv and then again in Jerusalem. Aware of the delicate nature of this visit, Grass spoke about the dilemma of using the German language in the Jewish state. And when he, he let's quote from Grass's speech, when he, the German visitor to Israel, as I do today, speak to you in the German language, Grass says, he knows all too well that this language, whatever it expresses, causes pain in your ears. I love this language. Because of it, and only because of it, I am here, however contradictory that may be. So the words of Günther Grass. The audience in the overcrowded auditorium in Jerusalem was genuinely moved. Among them were many young students who had never heard a speech in German. There were old Yekes, German Jews, who had been longing for that moment to occur. Also in the audience was the recent Nobel laureate, Shmuel Yosef Agnon, and his wife, a native of Königsberg. The couple had left Germany in 1924, when their house in Bad Homburg had burned to the ground. The ice was slowly melting. When Heinrich Böll visited Israel in 1969, he was now actually received by the same Israeli Writers Association that two years before had to refuse to meet with Grass. And in 1971, Heinrich Böll's Ansichten eines Clowns Opinions of a Clown, became the first book by a post-war German author to be translated from German into Hebrew. Soon Israelis staged a week of new German cinema and a tour of the Ballet of the Württembergische Staatstheater, and both were great successes. But a lot of sensibilities remained. The, re the resistance against the use of the German flag and national anthem after all, it was the same melody as during the Nazi period, were widespread. When Grass returned in 1971 for his second and actually last visit to Israel, he became witness of street protests against the German Culture Week that year. The German planning was indeed not very sensitive as it coincided with the anniversary of the pogroms of November 9th, of 1938. It was only after 1973 that cultural relations between the two states began to normalize. The Hamburg State Opera toured Israel in 1974 with its Moses and Aaron production. And whoever has seen Moses and Aaron knows this is a large production. They brought over 400 people to Israel to perform that opera. In terms of academic and research cooperation, the doors opened relatively early between German and Israeli scientists. As we've heard before, in 1959, a delegation of the Max Planck Society, led by its president Otto Hahn, visited the Weizmann Institute just a year before the historical meeting between Chancellor Konrad Adenauer and Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion in the New York Waldorf Astoria Hotel. The German government provided startup capital for research and exchange of scientists between Israeli institutions and the Max Planck Institute. And in 1964, the Max Planck Society established the Minerva Foundation as a subsidiary for its special relationship with Israeli institutions. Since 1973, each year between 50 and 70 Israeli German and German scientists are supported as part of the Minerva's exchange program. 
In addition, starting in 1977, 28 Minerva research in centers have been established in Israel, and they also include institutions of the humanities and social science. Two special Israeli-German cooperation networks have been set up. The GIF, the German-Israeli Foundation for Scientific Research, established in 1986 by the ministers of both countries, and the DIP, the German-Israeli Project Cooperation, established in 1997. These research corporations have substantially transformed the Israeli research landscape and has also have an important impact on the German one. Many important insights in the sciences and humanities, in law and in business, have resulted from these corporations. And more recently, the Federal Ministry of Education Research has established a third major initiative, the Martin Buber Society of Fellows, which brings together young scholars, postdocs, uh, especially in the areas of humanities and social sciences. And many other institutions, including the DFG, the DAAD, the Humboldt, and political foundations have established their own programs. The Volkswagen Foundation is indeed one of the leading and most instrumental sources for this cooperation and has been so from early on. Since 1977, almost 400 research projects were funded by the foundation and if I understand correctly, during the first years of this support, actually the vast majority of support for any foreign research cooperation by the Volkswagen Foundation went to Israel. German studies have become a topic of major interest in all Israeli institutions of higher learning. And a few of them have been mentioned here before. In 1971, as we heard, the Institute of German History opened its doors at Tel Aviv University. Six years later, it was followed by the Kirbner Institute at the Hebrew University. Both universities have German studies department, and in Israel, we also have the Franz Rosenzweig Center for German, German Jewish intellectual history and culture. The Ben Gurion University of, ne of the Negev hosts a center for Austrian and German studies, originally established by the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And um, the University of Haifa has both a Butzerio Center for Research of Contemporary German History and Society and Barilan University, and sorry, and the DAD Center, and Barilan University is home of a chair of Prussian history, which we don't even have in Germany. In addition, there are two DAD centers, one I mentioned Haifa, one in Jerusalem. In 1979, also the Goethe Institute opened its doors in Tel Aviv, and a few years later, a Jerusalem branch followed. Let me say, though, that in conspicuous contrast, in 50 years of diplomatic relations, not a single research institute or chair at any German, public German university, was dedicated to the study of Israel, its culture, society, and literature. I am proud to announce that we will open the first such center for Israel studies at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich in June of this year. It will start as a modest center, but hopefully will soon be able to grow into a major hub for the study of Israel in all its aspects. And this is also in a global context. Europe, just as North America, has seen a growth in the field of Israel studies in recent years. Numerous new chairs have been established, especially in the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. Fifty years after the establishment of diplomatic ties between Israel and Germany, it seems to me the right opportunity to expand this field to Germany as well. In the high school curricula of many German states, the Middle East conflict and Israel are topics of several teaching units. Certainly in Bavaria, this is the case. But where do the teachers get their knowledge from if we do not have the institutions to teach this? We have all kinds of think tanks on the Middle East in Germany, but the scholars of these institutions are trained at German Middle Eastern Studies Institutes where the areas of expertise are usually restricted to the Arab world, Turkey, and Iran, and accordingly, the languages taught there are Arab, Turkish, and Persian. Israel remains a void on the map of Middle Eastern studies. 
Israeli writers from Amos Oz and David Gossman to Zeruiah Shalev and Etka Keret are enormously popular in this country. But there is no single professor specializing in Hebrew literature at any public German university. It is our goal to establish the first such position, hopefully in Munich, but you're welcome in Niedersachsen or anywhere else as well, and hopefully others will follow. Ladies and gentlemen, the example of German-Israeli relations can show that reconciliation is not only possible, but re reconciliation can be enormously fruitful. The cultural and especially the scientific and the scholarly collaboration between these two states have exceeded not only the expectations that people had a few decades ago, they went well beyond their wildest imaginations. And still, as I try to point out at the end, we should not feel that everything has been achieved yet. And we should also take the opportunity of this anniversary to point out what has not yet been done. This year, the 50th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the two countries is an excellent opportunity to probe new fields of cooperation and research projects. Thank you very much.